boy, oh boy. Boy, if there's anything you don't often hear preached on, it's Genesis chapter 1. It's creation of this planet. I want you to understand, God created this planet. And we find out later on when Jesus comes and Jesus begins preaching and preaching and preaching the same message over and over and over, you begin to realize that God had a purpose for creating this planet, and it was so that he could have his kingdom. A seen, listen to me, a seen kingdom. The Bible tells us the things which are eternal are not seen. The glory of God in heaven is unseen. God stepped onto the scene and wanted there to be a seen, visible kingdom. That's why he created this world. Genesis chapter 1, you will find out six days of creation. First day, God created light. Second day, God created the air and the atmosphere. Third day, God created, see, he, plant, he, he brought forth seed, grass, and all of these other things in dry land. Fourth day, he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Fifth day, he created the fish and the fowl. Sixth day, he created the beasts of the field and mankind. In six days, he did it. And he was building it all up so that mankind could have a kingdom and have dominion in it. I don't know where all I'm going with this here this morning. Bear with me. I'm going to give you Bible on everything I'm going to say, okay? But God created this planet for man not to have sin but to have dominion. Mankind chose sin, okay? You understand that? Lord, where's my towel? I'm going to need it today. Ready? Genesis chapter 1. In the midst of all of it, how many knows the Bible tells us that God knew the plan from the beginning of the foundation? Revelation calls Jesus Christ the lamb slain at the foundation of the world. God knew what he was doing. God saw what he was doing. I have got some wonderful people over here. I'm getting me a fan. I'm going to preach right here. God knew what he was doing. And the Bible tells us, if you go to Ecclesiastes, you'll find that God said it this way. Look, the end will be as the beginning. That which has been done is that which shall be done. That which, that which has come to pass is that which shall be. There's nothing new, you know the rest, under the sun. I have read that scripture so many times, and if there's anything that I can realize that God put into place in the beginning, follow me, it would be something that he mentioned in that very verse. There's nothing new under the, I've missed it my whole life. He specifically named something when he talked about that. There's nothing new. He could have said under the clouds, under the stars, there's nothing new on the planet, there's nothing new in mankind. But he said there's nothing new under the... You guys are getting good at this. So I thought, Lord, if you knew what you were doing, all the way back then when you hung the sun on this, in, in, to, to light this world... If you knew what you were doing on that day when you created the sun, then I would like to know what you knew on that day. I would like to know. Because if God knew it then, he knew something. When he created the sun, I want to know what God knew. It's a mystery, isn't it? Kind of. Because God it took him a while, but he got around to telling us what he knew on the day he created the sun. It might sound funny here this morning. I'm not trying to get goofy. This is not an astronomy class, and this is not astrology. This is not uh, uh, hieroglyphics, Mayan calendar, nothing like that. Look, I ain't doing that, and I'm not going to debate any of those things with you. Forget it. This is the Word of God. How many can agree with me here today that if it's in here, ain't nothing we can do about it. I'm not going to If it's in here, there is no arguing. Now, I can argue doctrine with you all day. I can argue denominational differences. We can do that all day till we're blue in the face. But you're wasting your breath if you want to argue this. Can't do it. If it's in here, don't matter what you think. Don't matter what I think, okay? I said, Lord, 
I want to know what you knew on the day you created the sun. Number one, it might, for some people, surprise you to know that the sun was not created on the first day. He said, let there be light, not a sun. Jesus came to Pharisees and said, I am the light of the world. And they thought he was crazy. You know why? Because when Jesus said that, there are two different words for light in the Greek language. One of them is light, meaning knowledge. Okay? Another is light that is literal light, daylight. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he was saying, I'm the daylight. I am the daylight. That's why they looked at him so funny. You've got to be crazy if you think you're the daylight. But do you know why he could say that? Because the sun wasn't created till the fourth day. Jesus lit the planet for four days. He can literally say, I'm the daylight. Day number four of creation, Genesis chapter number one. Here's what he said. Here's what he knew when he made the sun. You guys ready for this? It's going to be a little treat here for you this morning. And I'm watching the clock. I know what time I started. I know what I'm going to do. Fourth day. Whew. Let's just go to verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for years. We're going to go on, but I'm going to read that to you one more time. You ready? God said, let there be lights, plural, in the firmament that's in the sky, the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be, say this with me, for signs, for seasons, and for, and for years. Let's read on. Verse 15. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light on the earth. Boy, let me tell you something. When Jesus made the sun, he got through a list of four things that he created it for before he ever got to the next verse and said, oh, and by the way, it's also here to light the planet. The sun, the sunshine, I've created it for a purpose. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a list of four things I created it for. Oh, and by the way, yes, I did create it so that you can see your friend sitting next to you. Yes, I did do that. You see what he's doing here. The purpose of light being in this world from the sun is a secondary thing. Now you guys are, you guys are, you, if you'll get with me, you'll like this here this morning, I promise, okay? Because I'll tell you, this earth had no need for a gaseous ball of, of helium in, in, a, in a fusion reaction 93 million miles away. The earth had no need for that. It did not need that gaseous ball we call the sun to light this planet. Jesus proved that for four days. Look, I don't need no sun. I can light the planet. Go to Revelation. It'll say, when New Jerusalem's on this earth, guess what he said? And there's no need for the sun because Jesus Christ does what he did in the beginning. He lights the planet again. So God makes a sun in the skies. And oh, by the way, it's there to give you daylight. But I'm a little bit more interested. Matt, take me back to verse 14. I'm a little bit more interested because I can't help but notice that when he said that which has been done is that which shall be done, that which has been said, uh, that which has been spoken is that which shall come to pass. There's nothing new under the sun. Ooh, it strikes out to me. I don't know about you. I'm just that kind of guy. But I say, Lord, if you knew when you made the sun that there was nothing new, you knew it back then, you know it now, I want to know what you knew when you made the sun. And then I can't help but notice that when you said, I'm going to make the sun in the heaven, I'm going to put lights in the heaven, I'm putting them there for the purpose. And the first purpose I'm going to tell you about is sign. You guys like, you, 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 would you guys like to hear more on this? I can shift gears on going something else. I promise. I got some other stuff in here. The thing that I find extremely interesting is the word sign. See, this is English. This is, King, this is New King James. If you got King James, it says the same thing. Signs, seasons, Okay. Translated into English from original language. Original language was not English. Original language here was Hebrew. 
okay? Semitic Hebrew. That is older than you can imagine. And the Hebrew word used for signs is used in another place in the Bible. And I'm going to take you to it and show you the other place he used this word. Because from the beginning of time, God, when God put the sun in the sky, it started our calendar, didn't it? You've heard, you've heard people say, time is man-made. That's foolishness. God made it. Okay? God made time. He started his clock on that day. And that clock has been ticking and counting to a time that is to come. And that time, I don't care what denomination you are. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you think the Bible tells you. And I don't care what grandpappy taught you. That time is counting down to a time that Jesus is coming. And he's coming here, and he's coming for you, and he's coming for me. Okay? And he has taken us out of here. I don't care what your domination says. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. He's coming to take you and me out of here. Okay? A a amen. But he said, I will put lights in the heavens... And they'll be for signs, for season, for days, for years. I can't help but my whole life notice how many people told me. You should never, and before I go any further, I'm not here to tell you when Jesus is coming back. I'm not going to do that. I'm not stupid, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I don't know as much as you don't know. But I can't help my whole life but notice that people told me, God made sure that you would never know when it's coming. Never, never know. Well, if God made sure we didn't know and didn't know and didn't know and it was going to come and get us like a thief in the night and you wouldn't know it and you're going to be laying there and whoop, where'd my wife go? If that was that way, then boy, God sure did make a whole lot of mistakes when he gave us all his clues. When he sent Jesus and said, let me tell you how it's going to be in the last days. It's going to be in the days of Noah. When he came in, in Luke, he said, let me tell you how it's going to be in the last days. You're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and diverse places. But the end is not yet. When you see them saying, Christ is here, Christ is there, Christ is in the wilderness, go not there. The way you uh, Look up high, redemption draweth nigh. Boy, he sure did point to a whole lot of specific times when he didn't want us to know. The truth is, he did want you to know. He wants you to know that he's coming. Oh, now, Pastor Phillips... They, that day is coming like a thief in the night to overtake you. Yeah, for the people who don't believe, read the rest of that verse. He said that is for the people who are unaware and don't believe. It will overtake them as a thief in the night. But he said, but I am not uh, that you should be overtaken as a thief in the night because you're children of the day that you be not overtaken. That's why Jesus went out of his way to tell him, look, when you see this stuff, be looking for me. When you hear him say this, you be looking up because I'm a coming. And if there's this message, the only message I got here today is Jesus is coming. And you've heard it for 100 years. Nobody in here is 100 years old. But you've heard it for years and years, your whole life, everybody in here. Jesus is coming. I hope this message hits home closer than any one of them. Because... Jesus ain't just coming. Man, he is coming soon. Not because the song says so, or not because it preaches good, but because Jesus gave us every clue we could ever have to know and be ready. And they've all come, and they all point to one thing, and that is be looking for Jesus, because he's coming. They'll be for signs and seasons. Let me take you to Leviticus chapter 23. I'm going to take you to the other place in the Bible that uses that same Hebrew word for signs. And it is not translated in this spot into the English word signs. It's translated into something else. Whoo, Lord, help me, Jesus. I'm watching the clock. Leviticus 23 is the other place in the Bible that uses that Hebrew word for signs. Let's start reading 23. Verse 1, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feasts, somebody say feasts. There it is. 
That's the other place in the Bible that word is used. In Genesis 1, he called it signs. In Leviticus 23, he calls it feasts. Same word. Feasts, if you read in the Scripture, let's read on. The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Holy convocations, hear me, literally mean dress rehearsal. That's literally what holy convocation means. It literally means do this every year so that you're good and practiced up for when the time comes. These feasts are signs of things that are to come. And I'm going to take you through a couple of them, and I'm going to show you, okay? Speaking to the children of Israel, you'll say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. God said in the beginning, look, when I knew what I was doing, even when I made the sun, I put into this planet, I put into my plan, I put into my law and my word signs that anybody can see and anybody can look at. And they will point you to the truth and they will point you to the pattern that God has been following that ends up with him coming back at any time. These are the feasts of the Lord. Next verse. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation, it's a dress rehearsal. Every Sabbath is a dress rehearsal for the Jews. It is a dress rehearsal for what? For the millennial reign. The seventh, the Sabbath. Okay, I'm going to get into Daniel's 70 weeks next month on our Wednesday night class. I'm going to show you a whole lot of stuff about that. Holy convocation, you shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Next verse. These are the feasts of the Lord. Holy convocation, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. They're not random. Jesus does not have some random number generator, and when it pops up, it takes everybody by surprise, and he says, oh, here it is, the day of the Lord. Nope, it's appointed. God knew it before he breathed breath into Adam. He knew it before he spoke light into this world. He said, I know when I'm coming. It's an appointed time, and I'm going to make it to where these people can look at my creation. They can look at the signs I've given. They can look at the feast that I've proclaimed. It's for an appointed time. And when you read all of these, he's not going to say, take the second Monday in May. He's going to say, you take the month of Nisan, the 14th, Every single year, I've got a specific day for you to do it on. And right here, go to the next verse, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight, that's Nisan, not a car, it's a month in the Jewish calendar, is the Lord's Passover. They were celebrating, we're going to skip ahead a few verses, they were celebrating the Passover in Egypt, and that is when the lamb, sacrificial lamb, shed its blood shed its blood and died and put the blood on the doorpost so that when the death came, it passed over them. This was the first feast mentioned. And he said, by the way, I want you to celebrate that every year, and I want you to do it the same way every year. I want you to have a feast. I want you to have a Seder meal. I want you to get together at 6 p.m. when the sun goes down. I want you to put the blood on the doorpost. I want you to take the lamb inside, eat every bit of it, break no bones, the whole nine yards, and you're going to do this every single niece on the 14th, every year. You're going to do it for 3,500 years by the time 2014 comes around. You're going to have been doing it that whole time because it is something to be remembered and it is an appointed day. Go with me. You don't turn there. I'll just take you there to the Gospels. Pick any one of them that you want and it will tell you when Jesus Christ was led up on a mountain called Calvary, it will tell you when it happened and when Passover was nigh. God appointed a day 1,500 years before Jesus came, he appointed a day and said, this is the dress rehearsal for the Passover feast and what's going to happen on that day. Every year they're going to practice it. And they did it again on Nisan the 14th, the day Jesus Christ died. Oh, now that, that's poetic. That works out real well. You ain't seen nothing yet. Huh. 14th day of the month of twilight is the Lord's Passover. Next verse. 
On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread of the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Unleavened bread was commemorating how they were not able to leave Egypt and bring everything with them. They had to leave the day after the Passover and they had to leave their yeast at home or in Egypt, couldn't take it with them. So they spent a long time in the wilderness without it. That's why they had to eat unleavened bread. That's why we have unleavened bread at the feast when we commemorate the Lord's Supper. Unle uh, leaven or yeast in the Bible is always commemorative of sin. When Jesus Christ died, and he died and went into the ground, the next day the Jews began their commemoration of the next feast. And that was a feast of unleavened bread, which commemorated sin is now out of my house. Okay, it just hits me. That's fine. I'll pray. Come on now. Jesus died on the day that the lamb shed its blood to save them from death, and then the next day is the feast that celebrates that sin is out of my house. And God ordained it 1,500 years prior. There's two feasts that God has already come through and fulfilled. Are you following me here today? Go to the next one. Oh. 13, Lord spake to Moses saying, Take outside the camp him who has cursed. Let all uh, who heard him lay their hands on his head. Let all the congregation stone him. This is talking about literally the old man is dead. You understand that? This was uh, commemorating the fact that the one who once was alive, talking about your old sinful man, is gone. This is what they commemorated the day after Jesus died. Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. Verse 10. Speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, When you come into the land which I give you, reap its harvest. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, this is the next feast, the next day, okay? Day one, it's Passover. That's the day Jesus was crucified. Day two, unleavened bread. They celebrate that sin is now out of their house. Day three, they celebrate what comes. You're going to love this. They celebrate... The coming out of the ground, of the grain. Because they just harvested the barley. Wheat has been growing all winter. And when they get the barley out of the way, on that third day, the ground breaks open. The ground breaks open and wheat starts coming out. You know, Jesus called you the wheat. He's going to separate the wheat from the tares. You are the wheat because you are with Christ. And Christ was that first bud of wheat that came and busted out of the ground on that third day, on that feast of first fruits. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Feasts. Oh, we ain't there yet. Don't worry. Feasts. I will make signs so that you'll know. And later on, I'm going to call them feasts. And you're going to do it every year. And, I, and here's what God said. I knew from the beginning of time, so here's what you better believe. I ain't going to miss a date. Jesus Christ proclaimed seven, or God proclaimed seven feasts. Take me back to verse 1, Matt. Before anybody starts saying, look, I don't know about these Jewish feasts. I don't know about these feasts of the Jews. Careful. You've just misquoted something. They're not the Jews' feasts. They're not my feasts. They're not your feasts. Matt, verse 2. Speaking to the children of Israel, saying to them, the feasts of the... They're not mine. They're not yours. They're his. They're not Jewish feasts. They're not feasts of Israel. They're not feasts of the, of the Hebrews. They are the Lord's feasts. Okay? 
He didn't mean this just for his select group of people at one time in an Old Testament era. He said, these are my feasts. You better observe it. Jesus came on a Passover night, took out the Passover bread, went ahead and skipped a day and pulled out unleavened bread and broke it and said, let me show you what you're going to see tomorrow. You're going to see the body broken. You're going to see the blood shed. And this do as often as you eat and drink it. And remember to me, in other words, don't you quit now. Because God's feasts were not meant to come to a certain point and end because they didn't. And I'm about to prove it to you. The next feast is the fourth one. I'm going to take you there. Are you ready? Whew. Verse 15. This is from first fruits. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. Okay, the day after the Sabbath is, is the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay? No, I'm sorry, the Feast of First Fruits. Lord, help me. Count for yourself the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Verse 16. Count, somebody say it, 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Next verse. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah. That's just a measure. They shall be fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits of the Lord. Verse 18. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull, two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offering and their offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Verse 19. Then you shall sacrifice a kid. Boy, this is a busy day. Then you shall sacrifice a kid of the goats as a sin offering and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice, a peace offering. This is an important one. Do you guys notice that? Verse 20. The priest shall weigh them with the bread of the first fruits away of offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. Verse 21. And you shall proclaim on the same day that is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. You shall be uh, a, sta a statute forever in all of your dwellings throughout your generations. When you reap the harvest of your land, it's talking about the wheat. You shall not wholly reap the corners of the field when you reap, nor shall you reap any gleaning of the harvest. You shall leave them for the poor, for the stranger, for I am the Lord your God. Somebody tell me what feast he's talking about. You can use whatever term you want to use for it. There's a correct one, but use the one you know. Come on, what feast is he talking about after 50 days? Say it louder. You know it. Say it like you mean it. Pentecost. It's known as the Feast of Weeks. And it's 50 days after it is 50 days after first fruits. Read your Bibles. Jesus appeared to the brethren for 40 days after he resurrected. From first fruits, he walked on this earth for 40 days. Ascended on the 40th and told him, you wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Oh my goodness, Pentecostal people in here, help me quote the first verse in Acts chapter 2. How does it start? I'll help you. And when the day of was fully come, 50 days, their next feast in the line of feasts, when Pentecost was fully come, God said, I've had my eye on this date for 1,500 years. It's time. The day of Pentecost is fully come. And it's time for me to do what they've been practicing for 1,500 years. I'm about to pour it out on 120 people who's about to birth my church in an upper room in Jerusalem in 32 A.D. In the middle of, in the, in the middle of people that hate them, I'm going to put power on them like they've never seen. Because this one, you read it, it goes on forever. This one was important so God has kept the feast of the Passover. He nailed it, buddy. 1,500 years after the fact, he nailed it. The feast of the Passover was when he put the sacrificial lamb of Jesus Christ up on the doorpost, which is the cross. 
shed his blood. Next feast that God ordained, Leviticus 23, man, God nailed it again. The, 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 the feast of unleavened bread, sin is out of my house. Oh, man, if he ever nailed one, it was the third one. Feast of first fruits commemorating when the fruits burst out of the ground. That's when Jesus rolled back the stone and came out of the ground. Man, God is good at this, isn't he? And to put the icing on the cake, God said, let me get one more of them just right. Fifty days later, when the day of Pentecost is fully come, I'm going to commemorate their Feast of Weeks by sending down my spirit to reap what has been sown. And that is the Spirit of God being planted in somebody's heart. And when the Holy Ghost came, they were now able to reap and to harvest the Spirit of God. But then he said, Don't, but, but by the way, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mary, the other 120 left of you, it ain't just for you. Because I told you 1,500 years ago that when we harvest this, it ain't just for you. You're going to leave the corners of the field. And that's going to be for whosoever will. Come and drink of the water of life freely. Man, God nailed it all the way. Woo, hallelujah. He did. So if God said in the beginning, look, you better pay attention to my feasts. You better pay attention to my seasons. Because I knew it back then. If God said it then... And then he proclaimed seven feasts, and the first four of them, he nailed them on the head. I'm going to tell you something. It would be who of you to know what the next feast is. How many wants to know what the next feast is? How many people, other than you, the ones of you, are looking feverishly because you want to know what it is? It would be who of you to know what that next feast is, seeing as how so far God's four for four that we call the Feast of Mystery. Because in the whole Bible that just listed eight verses to talk about one feast, in our whole Bible, God mentions this feast twice and tells you nothing about it. It is the Feast of Trumpets. It is on the first of the month of Tishri, the Jewish calendar. It is their Jewish New Year. The first of Tishri, going back in history, is the day that Joshua led an army to a city called Jericho. And walls came falling down, and suddenly a new land was theirs. It is the New Year. It is when the trumpet of God will sound. And it's next on the list. That coming from a God who's four for four on the others. The next one on the list is a trumpet sounding and walls falling down and a new year, a new generation, a new land a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, and a new earth. That's the next one on the list. Are you ready? It's a mystery. He didn't go into detail and tell us what all happens on the day of trumpets. They're all good. Sweating too much? I'm sweating like an idiot. If you need me to stop, I'll stop, but I've got a few more minutes. You're okay with that? Because there's two more feasts. That feast of trumpets is going to get you and I out of here. And you better know it, and you better believe it, and you better be ready for it. You read your Bible every time that God was about to cleanse the land with judgment. He took his people out of the way first. Noah, build an ark, because I'm going to bring judgment to cleanse the land, to make it once again what I need it to be for my kingdom. So Noah, get yourself on that boat so I can get you out of the way. 
Moses, I'm about to bring uh, 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 judgment to a place called Egypt because of what they've done. I've heard the cries of my people, but I'm not doing it until you will go down there and get my people out of the way. The rapture is biblical. I want you to understand that the Bible talks about a day when no man knows the day or the hour. Yeah, day or the hour. I get that. We ain't going to know that. He didn't say you weren't going to know the season. In fact, he said, you can look at my map. You can look at my calendar, and you'll know when the season has come because you'll be able, according to Scripture, at the right time to look up for redemption draweth nigh. You're going to know when it's coming, and it's coming now. And if you don't believe me, I, I highly suggest you get a hold of the Lord so that he can convince you that he's coming at any minute. I'm going to take you to the book of Genesis real quick. The book of Genesis. I'm going to switch mics, guys. Number three. The book of Genesis. Am I here? Hey. You'll read about a guy named Joshua. Joseph, I'm sorry. Joseph. I'll sound different on that one. Joseph went into Egypt in slavery. A land that was foreign to his kingdom. Joseph is an Old, Tes Old Testament picture of Christ. If you never realize that, I want you to search that out and see it. Joseph is an Old Testament picture of Christ. He was sold by his brothers like Jesus was sold by Ju Judas. He had to go live in a land that was not his native place. Jesus is the Word made flesh and dwelt amongst us. He lived in a place for 33 and a half years that was not his native land. He, Joseph was wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife. Jesus was wrongly accused by Pilate. Joseph is an Old Testament picture of Christ. Joseph, you guys ready? Joseph let his brothers come to him in his land three times. Three times. He let his brothers, the 11 of them, come to him in his land, which at that time was Egypt. You ready for this? Jesus has let his brethren, the Jews, return to their land three times. One time with Moses... Second time after Babylonian captivity. Third time in 1948. And it happened in your and my generation. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, when you see these things, this generation shall not pass until all things be fulfilled. I'm telling you, he's coming and he's coming and he's coming. He let his brethren come into his country three times. Let me tell you what he did on the third time. The third time was different. The third time was permanent. The third time was not like the other two. Because the third time, Joseph let his brothers come into the room with him. And when he got them all ready and assembled, and things were taking place that needed to take place, he turned to the Egyptians. You're going to love this. He turned to the Egyptians and said, leave the room. The, gent the Egyptians were Gentiles. This is a prophetic picture. The Jews are back in their homeland for the third time. Jesus is about to turn to the Gentiles and say, please leave the room. That's you and me. That's his Christian church. We're the Gentiles. He's going to put us out. Leave the room for a minute. I need to reveal myself to my brothers. And Joseph did reveal himself to his brothers. We all growing up in here? Do you know how he did it? He showed them his circumcision. Proved to them that he was a Jew just like them, their brother. In other words, to prove himself to his brethren and to reveal himself for who he was, he had to show to his brethren the scars in his flesh which is what the Bible says Christ will do to the nation of Israel once the Gentiles are out of the way. He will come to them and show them the scars 
and his flesh, and then they will believe, 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 and then they will believe.